Before the midterm, we discussed multiple regression, which allowed us to make ceteris paribus comparisons and control for the effects of formerly omitted variables. This week, we'll cover some techniques that allow us to modify and expand multiple regression to account for relationships between variables that don't fit neatly into the simple linear structure imposed by it. We'll start off by examining how regression can be used to capture non-linear relationships between variables. Let's say we're interested in whether students who go to larger high schools perform better on standardized tests like the SAT. Using a data set of high school seniors, we regress each student's SAT score on the size of their high school's graduating class, which gives us this result. Notice that the coefficient on class size is positive and statistically significant which would seem to indicate that an additional 100 peers in a student's graduating class raises that student's SAT score by five points. However, if we contemplate the issue further, it's likely the case that the relationship between school size and SAT score is nonlinear or parabolic, like this. It's possible, for example, that some schools have too few students, but others have too many. When there's very few students at a school, adding students might have a positive effect on student performance due to peer effects. But when the number of students at a school is large, adding students decreases test scores as student-teacher ratios fall and spending per pupil drops. What we'd like to do is fit a parabola to our data instead of a line like we typically do. If you remember high school algebra, you might remember that we can do this by adding this variable equal to school size squared to the right hand side of our regression, and then estimating beta 1 and beta 2 like we would for any multiple regression model. To do this in Stata, let's generate our squared variable, also called a quadratic term, and then regress SAT scores on school size and school size squared, which gives us these results. Notice that the coefficient on the quadratic term is negative, indicating that the parabola opens downward, as we suspected. Taking a look at a fitted values plot, we can see that our model has a turning point where additional students stop helping and start hurting a school's average SAT scores. For any quadratic regression, we can find the value of this inflection point using this formula. In this regression, for example, the sign of the effect switches from being positive to negative at about 500 students. Let's take a look at a scatter plot of another nonlinear relationship. Here, instead of squaring one of our variables to create a quadratic transformation, we may want to instead take the natural logarithm of the variable. These log transformations are likely the most popular type of variable transformation that economists use. To see how useful log transformations can be, take a look at this scatter plot and regression line from our drinking water dataset. It's pretty clear that this regression doesn't do a great job of modeling the true relationship between safe water and GDP, which seems to be more exponential. Now, let's instead use the natural log of GDP as our dependent variable. The scatter plot now shows a linear relationship, and our regression line seems to fit the data much better. Looking at the regression output, how would we interpret this coefficient on safe water with log GDP as the dependent variable? Obviously, it means a one unit increase in safe water is associated with a 1 20th of a unit increase in the natural log of GDP, but there's a more useful way to interpret models with natural logs. See, thanks to the properties of natural logs, this coefficient is telling us that a one unit increase in safe water increases GDP by 5% since a unit change in logs is equal to a percentage change in levels. We can also use log transformations as independent variables, like in this example. Here, we would interpret the coefficient as telling us that doubling GDP per capita, or increasing it by 100%, increases life expectancy by about three years. In general, consider using log transformations for variables that are always positive, as well as for values like population where there's a lot of variation. Logs are less commonly used for variables measured in years, like schooling, age, and experience, and for variables that are already percentages or proportions, such as the unemployment rate or the pass rate on a test. Let's say we're interested in building a model of housing prices as a function of pollution and the number of bedrooms that the house has. Marge, I had a lot of calls about you. Customers love your no-pressure approach. Well, like we say, the right house for the right person. Listen, it's time I let you in on a little secret, Marge. The right house is the house that's for sale. The right person is anyone. But all I did was tell the truth. Of course you did, but there's the truth and the truth. Let me show you. 
It's awfully small. I'd say it's awfully cozy. That's dilapidated. Rustic. That house is on fire. Motivated seller. We've got three variables, a house's price in dollars, nitrous oxide concentration in parts per million, and the number of bedrooms that the house has. We probably want to take the natural log of price, since price is never negative, and there's lots of variation. Ditto with our measure of pollution, nitrous oxide. Our room variable, on the other hand, is probably better left in the levels, since there's not as much variance in the number of bedrooms. When we run this regression, we get these results. Now, how can we interpret each coefficient? Well, recalling that our dependent variable is the natural log of price, then this coefficient tells us that if pollutant levels increase by 10%, then a house's price should decrease by 7.1%, holding the number of bedrooms a house has constant. This coefficient, on the other hand, tells us that adding one additional bedroom increases a house's price by 30.6%, holding pollution levels constant. Again, log transformations are some of the most commonly used variable transformations in econometrics, but they do have some downsides. Most notably, it's harder, but not impossible, to use models with a logged dependent variable for forecasting values of y. Similarly, since we can't compute the natural log of zero, we can't use log transformations on variables that have observations with values equal to zero. Although sometimes economists get around this by just adding one to the variable before taking the logarithm. Next, let's talk about how to incorporate qualitative information into regression analysis. We started off the course by examining cases where our independent variable of interest, also called a treatment, was a binary variable. Whether someone was in the hospital or not, whether or not someone drank coffee during their pregnancy, or whether or not someone attended a private school, and so on. Binary variables, also called dummy variables or indicator variables, are a useful way for us to incorporate qualitative information into our regression analysis. Let's start simple. How do females compare on the SAT compared to males? Previously, we might answer this question by taking the average scores of females and males in our sample and performing a two-sample t-test. Doing this shows that the average female score is 43.07 points lower than the average male score, and that this difference is statistically significant. However, what if instead we regress SAT scores on a binary variable that equals 1 if a student is female and 0 otherwise? Well, doing so gives us these results. Does this coefficient look familiar? It's equal to the difference in means between females and males. And look, it's statistically significant too, just like our t-test. When we use binary variables in regression, the coefficient is going to be equal to the difference in the average value of the dependent variable for the group for which the binary variable equals 1, and the group for which the binary variable equals 0, after controlling for the effects of other included variables in the regression. Now we can build regression models that incorporate both continuous and categorical variables. For example, this model estimates the effect of high school GPA and being a student athlete on SAT scores. What we're doing with this model is conditioning on the athlete variable, estimating the relationship between GPA and SAT scores for athletes and non-athletes separately, and then taking a weighted average of the two coefficients, using the size of the athlete and non-athlete groups as weights. The coefficient on the athlete variable here represents the average difference in SAT scores between athletes and non-athletes after controlling for the possibility that athletes and non-athletes have different GPAs. Visually, the coefficient on the athlete variable represents a shift in the intercept, like this. What if we have a categorical variable that has multiple values? For example, we have survey data from 1,400 college students. This variable tells us the number of alcoholic beverages that the respondent consumes in a typical week. This variable tells us the respondent's GPA. And this variable is categorical. It's the respondent's religion, coded so that its values are numerical. So 0 is Christian, 1 is Jewish, 2 is Muslim, 3 is Hindu, 4 is Buddhist, 5 is other religion, 6 is agnostic, and 7 is atheist. We want to examine the effect of religion on alcohol consumption, but just adding this religion variable to our regression doesn't make much sense. Instead, let's make a dummy variable for each religion, and then add all but one as independent variables in our model. We can't include all seven because then the religion variables will all sum to one for every observation, creating perfect collinearity. It doesn't matter which one we emit, as we'll see. 
So, let's regress our drinks variable on GPA and our six religion dummies, giving us these results. Since we omitted the variable that indicates that a person is a Christian, this coefficient is telling us that Jewish students have about two and a half more drinks per week than Christian students after controlling for differences in GPA. And this coefficient is telling us that Buddhist students have about six fewer alcoholic drinks per week than Christian students after controlling for GPA. To create a matrix of binary variables from a coded variable like this quickly, we can put an I and a period in front of our religion variable in a regress command, and Stata will automatically create an indicator value for every value of the variable. It's even smart enough to drop one of the variables in order to avoid perfect collinearity. Next, let's talk about interactions between variables. Sometimes it might be the case that the effect of one variable changes based on the value of another variable. For example, we know that more job experience leads to higher wages, and we know that more education also leads to higher wages. But maybe it's possible that the payoff to experience differs based on education. Maybe more highly educated people learn better on the job, increasing the return to an additional year of experience. If this is the case, we may want to add another variable called an interaction term to our regression, which we can create by just multiplying together to the two variables we want to interact. In this case, we'd just multiply together our education and experience variables, and then regress log wages on education, experience, and our interaction term, which gives us these results. Now, interpreting models with interaction terms can be a little tricky. Since the interaction term is positive, we know that our basic intuition was correct. The return to experience increases as education increases. But knowing the actual effect of experience requires some calculation. Using this formula, where we plug in a value for education, so for someone with a high school diploma or 12 years of education, each year of experience raises wages by 3.2% while wages increase by 4.4% per year of experience for people with master's degrees. Interaction terms are especially useful and easier to interpret when they're combined with binary variables. For example, going back to our SAT dataset, we may want to see if there's an interaction between the effects of race and gender on SAT scores. So we'll create a variable equal to the product of our female and black indicator variables and run this regression. What are these results telling us? Well, we can use these three coefficients to find the average SAT scores for white males, white females, black males, and black females. Doing this, we can see that while white males score higher on the SAT than white females do, black females actually score better than black males. The gender gap goes in the other direction, which we would never know without our interaction term. Finally, let's talk about how we can account for the presence of heteroscedasticity in regression analysis. Back when we derived the variance of our OLS estimators, which allowed us to perform statistical inference and make conclusions about statistical significance, we assumed that the error term had a constant variance across our independent variables, also called the homoscedasticity assumption. If this assumption isn't being met, we say that we have heteroscedasticity, which might mean that the standard errors of our regression coefficients are biased. How can we tell whether or not heteroscedasticity is present in our data? One informal test is to just look at a scatter plot of the fitted values and residuals for each data point. For example, this residuals versus fitted plot displays homoscedasticity. The variance of the residuals is the same across the range of fitted values. Compare that with this scatter plot, which shows heteroscedasticity. At low fitted values, the variance of the residuals is small, and at large fitted values, the variance of the residuals is large, leading to this funnel shape. There are also more formal statistical tests that are used for the detection of heteroscedasticity, like the Bruch Pagan test, modified white test, and Goldfeld quant test, but most economists these days don't usually bother testing for heteroscedasticity. In fact, economists worry much less about heteroscedasticity than some textbooks would suggest due to robust standard errors. See, Back in 1967, statistician Fred Helm Eicher developed this expression that yields a valid estimator for the variance of beta 1 hat under any form of heteroscedasticity, including homoscedasticity for that matter. We can use this formula for variance to calculate heteroscedasticity robust standard errors, which provide a measure of variability in our slope coefficient that is reliable even if we do have heteroscedasticity. 
So if we want Stata to report the robust standard errors instead of the regular standard errors, we can select the robust option in the SE slash robust tab in the linear regression window, or add comma robust to a regression command in Stata like this. Since it's so easy to use robust standard errors, economists running regressions use robust standard errors by default, and so should you. There are some cases where robust standard errors might not be the best choice. For example, when observations are characterized by membership of multiple groups or clusters, then we should use a different robust estimator called cluster robust standard errors, but we'll discuss these in future weeks. As a general rule of thumb for now, if your data is characterized by clustering, use clustered standard errors, otherwise use heteroscedasticity robust standard errors, and just leave the regular standard errors alone. To wrap things up, all of the data sets we used in this lecture will be made available for you to download and experiment with. So try running a few of your own regressions, experimenting with quadratics, logarithms, binary variables, or interactions. If you find something interesting or having trouble, let me know in this week's discussion board. What's important to keep in mind is that these are tools for model fitting, not necessarily tools for causal inference. All the controls in the world can't rescue us from unobservable omitted variables or simultaneity bias muddying our results. Next week, though, we'll start by learning the first of a few techniques that use the regression framework in pursuit of causal inference, regression discontinuity designs.